Would you like to turn to Psalm 19, please? Psalm 19. We'll be referring to this very shortly, not uh, immediately at the beginning, but uh, very quickly. It's for the choir director of Psalm of David. That's actually in the Hebrew. Always good to know something of the background. Uh, sometimes we're talking a little bit more of uh, the background to a psalm. The heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expense is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words. Their voice is not heard but their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run its course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. There's nothing hidden from its heat. In other words, God's been speaking through his creation. And then the second part of the psalm talks about the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, and they are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Final, Father, in that final verse, that would be our prayer, that even today as we reflect on your word together, you will bless it to us, Lord. And just guard our minds and our, our, my mouth, that it may speak the words of the Lord. For your name's sake, Lord. Amen. Just to remind you again of Psalm 145. I was going to read all the psalm. Uh, but uh, yesterday we saw that it talks there about um, all your works shall give thanks to you, Lord, and your godly ones shall bless you. That's verse 10. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. We're very much taking up that matter that we're told by Jesus to pray your kingdom come. And then that statement, uh, uh, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. And we were thinking yesterday very much about uh, the, the power of the kingdom. Uh, particularly as it's directed towards us. And then that ultimate victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today I want to reflect on something of the glory of the kingdom. There in that psalm it says that God's kingdom is a glorious kingdom because at the heart of it is the majesty of our God. And yet how do we see all of that? Well in various ways of course in the psalm 19 points out very clearly that heavens are declaring the glory of God. Shame there's so much uh, light pollution around these days because I don't think we really appreciate the splendor of the heavens. And yet, of course, with uh, the Hubble telescope and other telescopes, we can see the, the, the sp surprising beauty in creation. But as we were saying the other day, equally, when we see the vastness of creation, the vastness of space, no beginning and no end to it, it reflects that we have an eternal God. And even in the light that is seen, we recognize, too, that God is light. Perhaps we need to remember that as much as the fact that God is love, because we are dealing with the Holy God. But there it is, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. 
The word uh, glory in the Old Testament is kavod. And it's quite strange in its derivation because it comes from a, a, a root meaning weight. And perhaps there's a job to understand just something of that, but it comes to mean something of uh, worthiness, of <coughs> splendor, of reputation. I suppose sometimes we feel that uh, we've got a bit of a weight on our shoulders to uphold the, the reputation that maybe of our family. I can remember as kids always being warm when we went to see some aunt or uncle or some relative. Now you behave yourself, don't let the family down. The weight of the reputation of the family was upon us. Uh, I don't think I've said it too much to him, but uh, probably needed to, much more than we did. Uh, but there it is, and in the New Testament it's doxa, which again has something of the matter of reputation, but honour, splendour, glory. And uh, of course we, we see that splendour in God's creation. Again and again I marvel just at the whole way in which things are interlocked. How could it just happen, evolve, when one part of creation is dependent upon another? You see a designer there. In fact, again and again we learn from, uh, from creation and see how creation uh, operates. And we manufacture things very often in accordance with that. There's the splendor of God. But you know, the glory and the splendor of God was seen as just as the kingdom has been always there, God has always reigned, something of his splendor and glory has always been seen. One day when the kingdom comes in at its fullness, my, what splendor we will see. But in the meantime, at Sinai, something of the glory of God was seen. With the thunder and lightning, the voice of God that shook the earth, as the writer to the Hebrews said, and it left them trembling. Dear friends, when we come face to face with the splendor of God, the holiness of God, we are left trembling unless our sin has been dealt with. That is if we really recognize that there is a God that we have to answer to. And many people want to dismiss him, of course. One of the values of evolution for those who don't want to believe in God. Yeah. But when we come face to face with the holy God, we are left trembling. Till we are cleansed through that precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were times when the temple and the tabernacle, the glory of God descended. In fact, the glory of God was there to lead them through the wilderness. God was establishing a people for himself, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. But in the end, he was working to a kingdom. Incidentally, I didn't say yesterday, but Matthew... It uh, talks about the kingdom of heaven, whereas the other writers talk about the kingdom of God. And I think Matthew deliberately did that because the Jews were in danger of looking for somebody to deliver them from Rome. They wanted a military leader. They wanted the kingdom to be very much one on earth, but uh, that heavenly dimension could easily be missed. In the end, as Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, otherwise my followers would fight for me. But there it is, the, the glory of God, we get a glimpse of it, uh, of it through the Old Testament and on into the New, of course. Ezekiel sees something of the splendor of God. It's interesting, you know, sometimes the things that are shown by God as he reveals something of himself, shows something of what he's about to do. Ezekiel's vision is all inspiring in many ways, but again, I think it leaves us slightly trembling as to what is to come. Because it talks about uh, one with, um, well, let me just uh, turn it up so that I've got the words there. In Ezekiel 1, talks about that uh, uh, in verse 24, well, even back earlier, there were the heads of the living beings, there was something like an expanse like an awesome gleam of crystal spread out over their heads. And then the cherubim are seen, and um, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of abundant waters as they went, like the voice of the Almighty, um, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army camp. <coughs> Again, there's reference there to what we see in the book of Revelation, something similar. But when you come down to verse 26, it says, Now above the expanse that was over their heads, 
There was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli in appearance. And on that which resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. Then I noticed from the appearance of his loins and upwards something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around him within. And from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like fire, and there was a radiance around him. As the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And I saw it. I fell on my face and heard a voice speaking. In the end, he was told to stand up and basically receive the message and declare it. But it's left him trembling. As again and again, surely it must when we stand before a holy God. And part of the, the matter here is uh, his appearance is like glowing metal uh, and something like fire. It's reminding us of something of judgment, I would hasten to add. Or certainly something of refining. And of course what is going to follow is that this glory of God is actually going to bring judgment upon Israel. Eventually the glory will depart. And the nation will be handed over. But it's the glory of God that brings that judgment because he's a holy God and he wants a holy people. And my friends, whether we look at the Old Testament or the New Testament, we need to recognize much more that God is holy. We're called to be saints. We're called to be holy. And that the blood of Jesus Christ does cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But even then, God requires us to live righteously. There needs to be that transformation. He's producing a holy people that has a heavenly call upon their lives. The glory of God needs to touch us. Of course, in this book, as you know, that eventually the glory departs from the threshold and then right out uh, to the east of, uh, uh, of the city of the temple, over the Mount of Olives. And at the end of the book, the glory comes back. The judgment is over. God is restoring. And whether God is there in judgment or in restoration, it's still the glory of God, <coughs> the splendor of God, the magnificence of God, the holiness of God. And we need to recognize that. I think it's very interesting, as I have said on many occasions, that you have this picture of the glory departing over Mount Olives and coming back from Mount Olives. Because, of course, that's exactly what happened years later. When the glory, the revelation of God departed, a nation that had said, away with him, crucify him. Thank God some responded. But he departed to go to heaven, actually to prepare the way for you and me. That we might be there in glory. Yes, thank you, but one day he's coming again in power and great glory. And as he went, he will come back. He went as a man, he will come as a man. He <coughs> went from the Mount of Olives, he will come back to the Mount of Olives. <coughs> but my friends, just in looking at Ezekiel, we recognize that we're dealing with a holy God. But isn't that something of the same picture that is in Revelation chapter 4? Uh, we'll come back to Revelation 1 uh, a little later, but in Revelation 4, again, we see a throne. And uh, verse 3, And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, and a sardis in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. And then we see the 24 elders, and verse 5, And out from the throne came flashes of lightning, and sounds and peals of thunder, echo of Mount Sinai. Interesting that both in this uh, vision and in the one that Ezekiel had, there was that matter, although there seems to be the emphasis on judgment, equally there's the matter of a rainbow. God's covenant promise <coughs> to mankind that he will not destroy completely again uh, by flood or creation. So although there's something of judgment and the holiness of God, at the same time there's something of the mercy of God is being indicated. So we recognize that we're very much dealing with our holy God. Then, of course, we have other pictures uh, uh, of Jesus. And this is all part of the kingdom. God is at the heart of the kingdom. The glory of God, the splendor of God is at the heart of the kingdom. And uh, we know that when Jesus came into the world, that he was the radiance of the Father's glory, the exact representation 
God has revealed Himself to man. Even in the works that Jesus produced, they were the works of the Father. Even in the judgments that Jesus brought, or the utterances that Jesus brought, He was bringing the utterances of God. He said He didn't do anything or say anything except what He saw His Father saying and doing. Although the church in Britain would really aim to be like that. We wouldn't have any apostasy. We wouldn't have any false doctrine. We wouldn't have any, well, pollution, corruption, spiritual corruption within the church. But uh, yes, Jesus was full of grace and truth. We beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Right balance between truth and grace. And then of course we get a glimpse of uh, that splendor, that radiance of, uh, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ and a touch of heaven particularly in Matthew 17 in the transfiguration. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his garments became as white as light. And uh, well, you know Peter's response and so on. And uh, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them and behold a voice out of the cloud. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him splendor, the glory, the whiteness, the light. You know, the glory and, of, uh, uh, and light are often brought together because God is light. He is holy. There is a splendor, there is a radiance that we see again and again. But here that heavenly touch is so much upon the Lord Jesus Christ. They get a glimpse of the heavenly man, if you can put it that way. And of course we know now that uh, Jesus has actually gone back to glory. Remember in Hebrews chapter 2 and uh, verse 9, it says, uh, well it uh, quotes uh, from uh, Psalm 8, but it applies it very much to the Lord Jesus Christ, because it says there in uh, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Again, we must remember that actually we have been saved from wrath and Jesus experienced the wrath of God at Calvary, the separation between the Father and himself, so that we don't need to face wrath as we accept what he's done. But now, having tasted death for everyone, he's crowned with glory and honor, seated at the Father's right hand. Again, we get a glimpse, don't we, of that heavenly man, or uh, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the book of Revelation. But again, we're left somewhat trembling. It says there in Revelation 1, then I saw, uh, the, uh, I, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it was made to glow in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. His right hand he held the seven stars. Uh, The seven stars which you saw in his right hand, uh, the seven stars are the seven angels of the churches. God controlling everything, Jesus controlling everything, and all power is given to him. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Again, the splendor, the glory, the radiance, the the sheer light. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. But his eyes like flames of fire, speak like burnished bronze. That's taken up with the churches because God is going, Jesus is going to judge his church. They've gone into error. 
have gone into adultery and idolatry and other things. We need to remember again that we're dealing with the Holy God. Even although we can come to God as Abba, Father, because of what Jesus has done, it's only on the basis of that. John even is falling at his feet as well, dead man, seeing God as he really is. My friends, I think we need a touch of a real vision of God within the church to purify it and cleanse it. Again, we can say we saw something of the glory of God as we look at Isaiah's vision. And uh, again, Isaiah, in the presence of the Holy God, said, Woe is me, for I am unclean, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. If we really see God as he is in his holiness, if we really see the glory of God, in our present state, it will leave us trembling. Because we know even <coughs> although we've been cleansed from sin, we're still far from where we should be. That's not where God wants to leave us. Because God wants to bring a touch of glory upon our own lives. <coughs> Let me take you to uh, John chapter 17. Incidentally, uh, John does say that um, uh, Jesus... Um, Isaiah saw the, uh, 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 Jesus, I think it's in John uh, 14. Uh, um, might be worth just seeing that. So Isaiah's vision was about Jesus as much as it was about the Father. Talks about, uh, my eyes have seen the, uh, um, the Lord God, uh, God of hosts, but it equally says that I saw the Lord. And it's Adonai there, not Yahweh. Um, yes, it's John, uh, I think, uh, well, no, I can't remember the reference. Anyway, Isaiah says that, uh, uh, rather John says that Isaiah saw Jesus. Uh, um, yes, it's uh, uh, chapter 12. So it's about uh, these things, Jesus, verse 36, these things Jesus spoke and he went away and, and hid himself. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he said, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Uh, previously he's been speaking of Jesus, so we believe that uh, this is how John understood that vision. In actual fact, of course, God said, who will go? Uh, who, uh, whom shall I send and who will go for us? So I think he saw something of a whole uh, triune God. Mm. But the point I was going to come to is in John chapter 17, that, uh, that uh, prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he prays for the church, and incidentally so often people are stressing that they may be one, yeah. do remember that uh, John 17, 17, they always seem to overlook that, where it says, sanctify them in the, in the truth. Your word is truth. The unity that he's praying for is a unity in the truth. And that we might be made a holy people, that we might be set apart for God through the truth, knowing the truth, responding to the truth. But I don't know whether you've ever reflected on those words in verse 22. The glory which you have, been gi have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. The glory which you have given to me, I have given to them. I tend to think of glory of all future. But have we received something of the glory, the splendor of God now? Of course we have. We have eternal life. We have life with Him. The Holy Spirit is coming for these disciples. Glory surely is all about being with the Lord. The Lord was with them. They had a touch of heaven upon their lives because the God of heaven was with them. Mm. You and I have had a touch of the glory of God. The Holy Spirit has come upon our lives. Let me take you to 2 Corinthians 3 to expand that a bit uh, further. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 where 
the Apostle Paul is, in the first place, talking about the old covenant. And he says it's a covenant that brings condemnation and death. But he says even with that covenant, there was something of glory. And he points to the fact that Moses, going into the presence of God, his face shone. There again, something, the radiance, the light. It's reflected light. And incidentally, Jesus is the light of the world, but he said, you are the light of the world. The reflected light of Jesus Christ ought to be seen in your lives. The Holy Spirit is there, producing the light of Jesus. But he goes on to point out, uh, verse 9, For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory in this case is no glory because of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains in glory. What he's really saying is, yes, when Moses went into the presence of God, his face shone. There was something of a, a real heavenly touch upon his life. But it faded. I'm not surprised sometimes when you think of all he had to do, deal with, with uh, that crowd of rebels, if we can put it that way. But soon, uh, when we're sometimes up against it in the attacks of, well, sometimes other people, uh, we can lose touch with the, with the presence of God. But of course, what he's saying is that that glory faded, but it should not fade with us. Because it goes on to say, but whoever, uh, whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So what it's saying is, yes, God's presence was there with them, Sinai, on the tabernacle, he went with them, the Shekinah presence. You have the Shekinah presence of God right in your mind and heart and will in your life. And he's there not to allow the thing to fade, but for it to grow. <coughs> Let the people know you over the years, me over the years, as many of you have. Where's the glory in my life? Yours. Are you more Christ-like today? Are you more open to the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit producing something of the character of God in you? Character of Jesus? That's the work of the Spirit. God's presence. You already have a taste of glory. In fact, the scripture talks about the, the, the Holy Spirit is given as um, an earnest, what's the other word? That, um, that's used sometimes. Pledge. Uh, Pledge. Uh, it has the idea of a down payment. You've had the first instalment, as I can put it that way. Well, yeah. But, uh, basically, God has already begun to change you. You have a touch of heaven upon your life. Was it um, a sister in the past wrote a book, uh, Heaven Here We Come? Um, I can't think of her name now off uh, hand. Uh, but... Pardon? Jean Darnell, I think it was, yes. And uh, basically what she said, we already have a touch of heaven. And we've had very much a touch of heaven as we've worshipped God here. As we've prayed, we've been in the presence of the Lord. I believe the Lord's been amongst us. He's promised to be amongst his people. We have something of heaven already. We have something of the glory. God is wanting to change you from one degree of glory to another. <coughs> We are being transformed. It's not all future. Mm -hmm. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Should be improving. That word transformed is very interesting. It's a, a metamorpho, which uh, we get metamorphosis from. Some of you have heard me say this before. A tadpole uh, uh, metamorphosing into a, a, a frog. Not very interesting picture. But a caterpillar into a butterfly. That's a much better picture because one day you're going to fly. But you're being transformed now. And in actual fact, it's the same word that is used that we transfer, uh, translate transfiguration. 
It's exactly the same word in the Greek. Jesus was transformed before them. The earthly really took on something of the heavenly. I pray that my life may take on much more of the heavenly. Because the Spirit of God is there. And where the Spirit is, there is liberty. Don't say you can't change. Don't say you can't be done with old <coughs> habits. Don't say you can't uh, uh, end with any sort of form of deceit. Because where the Holy Spirit is, there is absolute freedom. We limit God too often. Talking yesterday about, uh, the, you know, the kingdom of God is not a matter of words, but power. We need that power and the glory of the kingdom in our lives. I put down Ephesians 5, 27, and I can't think for the life of me what that's about. Uh, uh, yes, that's right, it is. Uh, it's about the church. Again, uh, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. He's sanctifying her so that she might, he might present to himself the church in all her glory. I don't know how you see the church. I don't know how God sees the church. I do believe that God is looking at part of his church and saying, yes, I am <coughs> sanctifying them. They are growing. There is something of my splendor about their lives and their witness. They are getting ready. They're being changed from one degree of glory to another. Well, that's the process as is going on. But we thank God that Jesus is coming again in power and in great glory. His kingdom will come here on earth as we have prayed. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and his Christ. Yes, he's coming in power and great glory to usher in his kingdom. And of course we shall be changed further. When we see him we shall be like him, says John in 1 John 3. Suddenly a transformation will happen. In our bodies for a start. No more catheters, no more uh, glasses, no more wooden legs, no more... Uh, 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 but our body will be like his glorious body. Completely changed. I think of those words in Philippians, uh, and uh, really we need to put it in the context of Philippians 3, which is all about the heavenly call upon our lives, that we press toward the mark for the prize of the call of uh, God in Christ Jesus. We should be moving on. Why? Because one day we will be citizens of heaven, as he points out at the end. And uh, we wait for a saviour, says there in Philippians 3, verse 20, the Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of his power that he has even to subject all things to himself. He will do it. But thank God he's doing it now anyway. Getting you ready. Don't leave it to the last minute. Actually, that word uh, about transform the body is uh, quite interesting. It's not the one we've considered just now, but it's one that... Uh, can be used of remodeling a garden. And gardens can be in different styles. You can have a cottage garden, which is where you seem to throw anything in and it all grows together. Uh, or you can have, say, a very ornate garden, uh, like some of those that uh, uh, were on the continent uh, with, um, I can't remember what the, the term is now, but uh, all laid out with topiary and so on, and uh, uh, not a thing out of place. That's something of a picture of what the Lord wants to do in our lives. It actually says in the uh, authorised version, transform our vile body. It's got the body of our humble estate here. Uh, vile probably has changed a bit in meaning, but it's basically saying our, our body that, well, it's far from what it should be, going to be transformed like his glorious body. This is what the kingdom is all about. This is what the reign of God is all about. To bring in that perfect world. And in Thessalonians, I know there's a number of references, but it's good to look at these different things. Uh, it talks there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, where the church is still experiencing persecution. It was born in persecution. Paul had to be driven, was driven out of the city. 
And uh, he says, those who do not obey the gospel and who are persecuting you, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints. In the margin here is God in, in the persons of his holy ones. He comes to be glorified in you, to complete the work, to bring you to perfection, so that heaven is fully upon your life and mine. And then uh, in the next chapter, and um, verse 14, it says, For this uh, he called you through the gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that kingdom comes when he returns in power and great glory. The transformation will be complete. Hallelujah. No more sin. Therefore, no more suffering or dying. No more tears. <coughs> of course, eventually we see what is the complete picture in Revelation 21. That new city coming down from God. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And there is no longer any sea, no longer any division. So then they the... New heaven and new earth, because even heaven was contaminated by, by the fall of Satan. And certainly this earth has been. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. <coughs> Church, in all her glory now. Transformation is complete. In verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. And so it goes on. It talks uh, 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 about uh, the city being like gold, if I remember rightly. But it's uh, uh, like crystal. Again, such a precious city, such a pure city, nothing opaque in it at all, no sin. But there's that radiance again, the light that is shining, and God himself is the light in that city. Friends, that's our destiny, that's the kingdom come on earth. Well, on a new earth, and a new heaven, where he dwells righteousness. You see, the kingdom is all about the splendor of God and that splendor touching our lives and completely transforming it. What a shallow gospel we often preach instead of showing clearly what the kingdom is all about. What is the final destiny? What God wants to do in your life and mine. I would suggest that perhaps we're still a long way from it. Let me ask you, friends, again. Jesus has given you his glory, he says. The glory and the splendor was there in the past. We get glimpses of it, sometimes showing that judgment has to come, sometimes to show very clearly that he is able to redeem us and make us new. The Spirit is wanting to touch our lives with glory. <coughs> that transforming work go on about beholding in a mirror is the glory of the Lord. Actually seeing it. Embarrass my wife now when we were on holiday uh, last time. Uh, there was a steward on board there that uh, we had seen before and uh, he said to Val, you're always smiling. Mm. He, he searched us out every day to talk to us. Deliberately he came over uh, when he saw us. And uh, Val said to him, uh, well, perhaps it's because I know the Lord Jesus Christ is my Saviour. Mm. Suggested that he got a New Testament and read it for himself. I guess sometimes there's a touch of the glory of God on our faces and in our lives. <coughs> Sadly, sometimes it's missing. Remember that you're being remade in the image of him who made you. Yeah. 
We often talk about us being made in the image of man. I'm sorry, we're made in the image of Adam largely now. Uh, made in the image of God, sorry, I put that wrong. If Adam is there all too often, instead of the image of the heavenly man. Kingdom is all about transformation from one degree of glory to another. We rejoice that one day we will be with him in glory. He wants to be with you now <coughs> in glory. Amen. But much harder better, I think. <coughs> but may it be increasingly so. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, I'm not sure that I fully grasp all of this even now and having considered it. But Lord, we pray that where I've fallen short that your Holy Spirit will take us on and certainly transform us, Lord. Lord, we pray that that old nature will increasingly disappear. That new image will increasingly be seen in us. And Lord, we can't help but finish by saying, come Lord Jesus. We long for you to come in power and great glory. We long to see you face to face. We know that we will be different people. Even our bodies changed to be like to your glorious body. Amen. So, Father, we thank you that we have such a marvellous hope. Yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.